Hello everyone. My name's Dave Giberson. I'm an instructional design coordinator at the San Diego Community College District, where I help to support over 30,000 students and 500 faculty engaged in online and web-enhanced learning every semester. Since I'm one of only three instructional designers employed by the district, we're just a little outnumbered. A major factor in our being able to effectively support online education at the SDCCD, despite this imbalance, is the subject of my presentation today, screencasting. As you're probably aware, screencasting is a very simple process, but an incredibly powerful instructional tool. It consists, quite straightforwardly, of recording activity on your computer screen in full motion while also recording what you're saying about it at the same time. Such a basic activity, but one that can create phenomenally effective multimedia learning objects of great variety in almost any subject area. For example, screencasts are often used in software training, to record PowerPoint lectures, it's a lot, that's a lot better than just posting the slides online, and to present information from websites and other online resources. Anything you might show to your student on your computer screen while they look over your shoulder can be played back by the student anytime, on demand, as often as they wish. You're really limited only by your imagination. At Online Learning Pathways at the SDCCD, we use screencasting both proactively, creating a large library of instructional screencasts available on demand 24-7 to faculty and students, and reactively, creating ad hoc one-off screencasts for faculty and students to answer specific questions and address specific problems. No way we could keep up with the demand for support that we meet every day without screencasting. So let's see how you can get started with this incredibly useful and simple technique. We're going to start off our discussion of the nuts and bolts of screencasting, not with video, but with audio. Because quite frankly, audio can be more important. People will put up with bad video. They won't put up with bad audio. It's too irritating to listen to. So you want to be fairly careful in selecting a microphone to use to make your screencasts. We'd strongly recommend avoiding built-in microphones like those in laptop chassis or built into webcams or monitors. They almost uniformly give poor results. We also generally use USB connected microphones because they're more likely to give consistent quality in our experience. One that we often recommend for beginning screencasters, and in fact use ourselves quite a lot, is a headset microphone with USB connectors on it. This Microsoft LifeChat LX3000 is one we've had a good bit of luck with, and you can see it's quite inexpensive. This will get you started with screencasting and give you exceptionally good results. If you don't like headset microphones, either because of the weight on your head or the fact that they can pick up breathing or lip smacking sounds more easily, or you just don't like the way they look if you're recording yourself while you're talking, you can go to something like the Blue Yeti, which is a very well-known USB microphone that sits on your desktop, gives excellent results, though it tends to be quite a bit more expensive than the lower end headset microphones. This thing is over $120 generally at Amazon. And it's also a good idea to have a pop filter if you're using a microphone like this that you're going to speak directly into. This avoids popping your peas. If you really want to get a bit more fancy with audio, you can go to a USB interface like the Focusrite Scarlett, which will allow you to plug professional microphones directly into your computer. Indeed, that's the setup I'm using right now on it with an Audio-Technica lavalier wireless microphone. This is what I'm using right now, as a matter of fact, to record this screencast. It's 
going to run you quite a bit more, however. The setup you see here is somewhere between three and four hundred dollars total, but it does deliver very high quality sound with very low background noise. But it honestly doesn't sound that much better than the twenty-five dollar headset microphone. Any of these choices will give you very listenable sound. Very well, now that we've got our audio straightened out, Let's talk about the first of the two screencasting tools we're going to be dealing with today. As we start this one, you might imagine yourself in a dark alley, a scruffy looking character come, coming up to you and saying, Hey, want to try a free sample? First one is always free, right? Any of your marketing types out there are familiar with that. Well, that's what Jing is. Jing is the gateway drug for screencasting, provided to you by a company with a lot of stake in selling you some more screencasting tools, including the other one we'll talk about today, Camtasia. But that's not the only one they have, so they, they got a lot of incentive to get you screencasting. In order to do that, they're going to give you an incredibly functional little piece of software and even more, as we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, to get to Jing, to get Jing, I should say, just go to www.techsmith, all one word, dot com, forward slash Jing, J-I-N-G, just as you see it right here on the screen. There's really not much to getting started with Jing. It is a an installable application. You have to install it on your computer and you do that by clicking this free download button right here and then pick the version of Jing that you need depending on your computer platform, either Windows or Mac. Or Mac. It works equally well on either system. If you need help with that we have a uh, tutorial on how to install Jing that is available through the ancillary materials associated with this presentation. So I'm going to assume at this point that you have Jing, the free Jing, installed. Not only will you get this marvelous piece of free software, but you'll also get a free account on TechSmith's hosting service called Screencast.com. That's automatically provided to you when you install Jing and sign up. It is a uh, hosting service optimized for screencasts, as the name suggests, so it's a very valuable tool. Uh, you, for free, you get two gigabytes of storage space on their servers, which is enough for many, many, many screencasts. And somewhat more limiting, you get two gigabytes of bandwidth a month. Uh, this is more than adequate for ad hoc use of Jing, as we're going to illustrate here. Though if you start using Jing to create uh, videos that are viewed by many people over a period of time, you may find that that two gigabytes of bandwidth a month is a little restrictive. So, let's assume, as I say, we already have Jing installed here. Indeed I do, and you can tell that immediately by looking for the little sun at the top of the screen. That's an indication that Jing is running. It, if you allow it to, starts up automatically when you boot Windows or Mac OS, and is sitting at the top of the screen ready for you anytime you need it. That's one of its great virtues. As the page here suggests, Jing is useful for creating screencasts, but also for creating static screenshots. It will do both. To do either one of those, you just mouse over the little sun and it grows pods, three of them. And right now, um, we're going to take a look at a couple of those pods. The first thing I'm going to take a look at is the setup or the more pod over here, the pod with the little gears inside it, because I want to make darn sure that Jing is hearing me. Uh, this, you will at some point in your career make a screencast with no sound, 
and you probably won't mean to. This is one way to avoid doing that with Jing. Once I bring up the Jing control panel here, I can click on the middle uh, circle here at the bottom, which is labeled Preferences. And there are a number of things I can do here, like manage my screencast.com account and so on. But what I'm looking for here is my audio input. And I click Select Device, and I may well have more than one microphone or one microphone input on my computer. And I want to make sure that the one I think I'm using is actually working. And we can see that here. This line in Scarlet is the microphone system that I'm using, intending to use right now. The other one is the built-in microphone on my laptop. Remember what I said about that. So I want to make sure I'm using the line in Scarlet, which I can do just by clicking on that rectangle there. That was the selected one, but you never know. It's always good to check. Also, it's good to see that I am, in fact, getting meter deflection here. So Jing is hearing me. So I'll just OK that. And that's all I really need to do in the preferences area right now. So I'm just going to tell it I'm done by clicking the Finish button. To record something using Jing, I tickle the sun again. And I click the leftmost pod, which is labeled Capture. When I l click on that with the mouse, I get a crosshair, which I can move around by moving my mouse. I'm going to draw in the area of the screen that I want to record with this crosshair. I usually just record the entire screen unless I have some specific application in mind. That's a matter of preference more than anything else. To draw in the area of the screen I wish to record, I just move the crosshair to the upper left-hand corner of the area I want to record, click the left mouse button on a PC or the mouse button on a Mac, and hold it down and drag that crosshair down and to the right until I've reached the lower right-hand corner of what I wish to record, and then let up. Now I've uh, reached my recording area. But suddenly, I, then I realize that nothing seems to work. I can't bring anything up. Case in point, you need to get whatever you want to record on the screen before you do this. To drop back, you just press the Escape key on the keyboard or click the little X here in the Jing control panel to cancel. And let's say I want to record uh, a short help video that will show a student how to access the printable tax forms on the IRS site, since this is April after all. All righty, let's go to, let's see, I have irs.gov here somewhere. Where did it go? Well, let's just pull it up here. So the first thing I'll do now is start my recording by selecting the area of the screen, once again, that I'm going to record. And then I, have, I go back to my Jing control panel here, and I've got several options. One is to redo the selection. I just did. But the other two are to either capture an image, a static screenshot, or video. So I'll go ahead and capture video just by clicking on that, and it counts down for me. To access printable tax forms, go to the IRS site at www.irs.gov and click in the top bar, Forms and Pubs. If you're looking for forms for the current year, click Current Forms and Pubs, and then type in the number of the form that you wish to uh, download, like the 1040. Then just click Find, and then click on the link to the form. The form will load 
in Acrobat Reader. You can either print it out immediately or save it by hitting the download button for later use. That's all it takes to find the tax forms that you need. All right, now I'm going to terminate my recording. By the way, look, notice that the Jing is keeping track of how long you've recorded here. There's a reason for that we'll talk about in a moment. I could at any point pause this recording and go to another screen or collect my thoughts or whatever and then resume recording. Now I've resumed recording. When I'm done, all I have to do is click the Finish button, the big square, and Jing gives me a preview of what I've just recorded. This allows me to ensure that I've recorded what I think I did, and especially to ensure that I've got sound. Let's see. To access Okay. No need to play all the way through. I did have sound, and uh, the recording looks fine. And I'm almost done. I do need to upload this recording to some place on the web from which it can be shared with my students or colleagues or whatever. Jing makes that about as easy as any screencasting software anywhere. To upload this to your screencast.com account that was created at the same time as your Jing account, all you have to do is click this button here with the three upward pointing arrows that's labeled share via screencast.com. Jing proceeds to upload the recording to screencast.com in the process compressing it so that it's small enough to stream across the internet. Once the upload finishes, you get this receipt message, if you will, and you're told that your capture is on screencast.com and the link is ready to be pasted. What Jing has done here in screencast.com has done is to send you the URL for the hyperlink that will be needed to access this uh, recording on the internet. You don't even have to figure that out or go and look for it somewhere, it's on your clipboard. Whether, you be, whether it be a PC or a Mac, it's on your clipboard. I can just close this and I can utilize this URL in any number of ways. I can use it to create a hyperlink or a web link, I should say, in Blackboard or another learning management system. I can use it to create a hyperlink in a web page, or I can just send it to my student or my colleague in an email. Since I've got the URL on the clipboard, I'll just paste it into my message. Press Enter to activate the URL, and send it off. And there it is. And all my client has to do to play it is click on the link in the email. And up it comes. To access credible tax forms, go to the IRS site at www.irs.gov and click in the top bar forms. And that's the complete production cycle for Jing. I mean, it's something you can do while you have someone on the phone or 
very quickly if you received an email asking for help or an answer to a question. It is a wonderful, easy, quick way to provide support to your students, to your colleagues, and totally free. You can even have your students use it to turn in work or to send you questions. It's amazing how much easier it is to discern what a student is trying to ask if they actually send you a screencast of this nature. So why would you need anything other than Jing? <laughs> it's a marvelous tool and you can't beat the price, but it does have some limitations. Uh, the first limitation is that the screencast that you do can't be more than five minutes in length. Now that's not necessarily that much of a limitation. It's a good idea to keep your screencasts short. But there are times when that can be a little confining. Also, it can only produce uh, video in one format, uh, shockwave flash object, SWIFT files, flash files which can get to be quite large if there's a lot of motion on the screen. So occasionally that's a bit of a problem as well. Also, Jing has no organic capability to edit what you've just done. If you want to add something to it or correct, correct a mistake or something like that. And there's no way to within Jing to add captions. So there are times when you need something with a little bit more power in your screencasting. And there are many, many, many options in that regard. The one we're going to explore today is the Cadillac of screencasting software, the top of the line Camtasia Studio from TechSmith, the same company that brings you Jing. In addition to being the best screencast recorder and producing software available today. Camtasia Studio and Camtasia for the Mac uh, also offer one of the best uh, basic video editors, uh, nonlinear video editors available today. They're both quite inexpensive as multimedia software goes and can be readily obtained from the TechSmith website at www.techsmith.com. Just mouse over products and select the version of Camtasia that will run on your platform. We'll be using Camtasia Studio today. You can buy it right from here. The price for Camtasia Studio retail is $300, but educators can buy it for $179. You can also download a completely functional free trial that will be fully functional for 30 days and will allow you to keep anything you create with it in that time. It's a great way to find out if this is going to work for you. We have other tutorials on how to install and configure Camtasia Studio and you'll find those on the website associated with this presentation. We're now going to work through an entire production cycle in Camtasia Studio for Windows from recording to publishing our screencast. As you're going to see, this program is exceptionally easy to use and is very easy to learn to use. That almost never happens. Those are usually mutually exclusive properties. I'm not at all certain how TechSmith managed this. hope they don't get in trouble but uh, <laughs> for violating that basic law of software. But I think you're going to see here that it is exceptionally easy to pick up and very powerful and quick to use. So we'll just start by recording a basic screencast. One of the best things you can do before starting your recording is to create what's called a storyboard for your recording, which will force you to plan your recording out very carefully. This will result in far shorter, more focused presentations and something that's just a lot easier for your viewers to watch. A storyboard's a very simple thing. It's just a, a table with a column of 
text boxes on the left where you'll put basic screenshots, if you wish, of the things that you're going to talk about. And then on the right, a series of boxes in which you'll type the script for what you wish to say about each stage of your presentation. And I've got a basic storyboard here for the presentation that we're going to be recording, a very short one, showing how to slow down your mouse cursor in Windows. This is a useful thing to do when screencasting because you're often using the mouse pointer to identify certain areas of the screen that you want to call attention to. If the mouse pointer moves too quickly, it can be very difficult for your viewers to keep up with it. So this screencast that we're about to record is going to show your viewers how to slow the mouse cursor down. So I can start recording just by clicking the big red button marked record the screen. This will bring up my Camtasia Studio recorder and there are a couple of things I need to check here first. One, I have to decide whether I want to use my webcam or not. I can turn that on easily enough. But in this case, I think we'll do without that. Um, I also need to decide whether I'm going to uh, record a f the full screen, which is the default, or a um, customized rectangle uh, within the screen. Most of the time, it's simpler just to record the full screen, and that's what we'll do now. Finally, I need to make sure that Camtasia Studio is hearing me. And we can tell pretty quickly that it is here by the deflection in the record meter here, the microphone meter. Um, if we don't see deflection here, we can check this menu right here and select the appropriate microphone if you have more than one. You also get to decide whether you're going to record system audio or not. Uh, that is audio that's played through the computer's speakers. I think we can probably do without that this time. Uh, now, we want to set our record input sensitivity so that we're not seeing red all the time like this. I can do that by sliding this pointer backwards until I just see an occasional bit of yellow without much, if anything, in the way of red. If I don't do that, if I record at too high a level, the sound will be distorted and harsh. But that should do fine. Very well. Um, the first thing we're going to want to do here is get our script, our storyboard, and take a nice deep breath and press the record button. Camtasia will count us down. Slowing the cursor down will help you create better videos by forcing you to record a little slower. It will also make it easier for your viewers to follow the cursor on the screen. In this video, we're going to show you how to slow your mouse cursor down. To slow down your cursor, first move your mouse cursor to the lower right-hand corner of the screen to bring up the Windows 8 charms. Click on the search charm and type in Control Panel. Click on the control panel hit to open the same. When the control panel opens, make sure you're in small icons view. Then double click the mouse icon. And this will open up the mouse properties window. Click on the pointer options tab and at the top of the pointer options tab is the section to adjust the pointer speed. Adjust the slider to your preferred speed. You should see an immediate effect on the speed of your cursor. Click OK to close this window. You have now successfully adjusted the speed of your cursor. Thanks for taking time to watch this video. When we're done here, we just to stop the recording, we press F10 on the keyboard. 
this brings up a preview of the uh, recording we've just made showing us that we did in fact record and that everything looks good and that we got sound. Once we've ascertained that we just click save and edit and give the uh, recording file, so-called camrec file, a name. There we go. The next thing we'll have to do is determine the editing dimensions with which we wish to work in Camtasia Studio. Uh, you're given a default possibility but allowed to select from a variety of predetermined options or to enter a manual option here. We are going to be working widescreen uh, with a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, width to height, so we're going to want to stay at that and it's just possible we may upload this to YouTube at some point, so let's pick the 1280 by 720 16 by 9 aspect ratio uh, high definition YouTube option and click OK. The last thing we'll want to do before starting to edit is to save what's called the project. Uh, we've already saved the raw recording file, the Camrec or Camtasia recording file, but we're also going to want to save what's called a project file because this is the file that will contain all the edits that we uh, apply to this recording in, uh, subsequently. That's very important to do that and to keep that project file saved and updated as we move along so that if the computer locks up or the power goes off we don't have to start editing all over again. So we'll just go ahead and save that project file and I'm just going to get a give it a uh, generic name here. To go with the Camrec file that we just made. And now we're ready to start editing. Let's take a quick look at the Camtasia Studio editor and production interface here before we get started uh, cleaning up our recording here, adding some things to it, and publishing it so that other people can view it uh, over the web. The, this area of the screen here, the upper left, is called the clip bin. This is where various media files ranging from video files to um, still images to animations, whatever, can be uh, stored while waiting to be used in the, uh, in the production. Just to the right of that, you have your preview window, which uh, allows you to see the results of any edits you make. Um, a important part of the preview window is the scrubber here which will allow you to very quickly move through the video and go to a particular point in the video that you want to see or that you want to edit. This is kind of a coarse scrubber, but you probably noticed the edit cursor down here on the timeline moving as well. That will allow you somewhat more fine control to come to a very specific point in the video. You can click and drag this cursor back and forth um, just by uh, clicking on the gray trapezoidal top uh, section of the edit cursor. You also have playback controls here under the preview window that will allow you to play through the video in normal time. Slowing the cursor down will and uh, controls will allow you to go from the beginning to the end of a clip very quickly. The other major part of the uh, editor display here is, of course, the timeline. 
this is where we're going to be doing most of our work. Uh, the timeline obviously gives you a linear view of the uh, presentation laid out uh, along uh, a timeline from zero time, the beginning of the uh, present, the beginning of the clip, up to the end, which is at uh, a minute and 57 seconds and 18 frames at this point. That's what this uh, number here tells you, and this of course is the total, which we happen to be right at the end, so that's the total um, duration of the project at this point. Here is the recording we've just made, the video clip with audio that we've just made, and it was automatically put onto the timeline for us in a one of the timeline tracks. We can have multiple timeline tracks, uh, basically as many as we want. They may contain anything from video to still images to audio uh, content that will all play simultaneously as we play across the content. We're now going to start uh, doing some editing on this clip. Uh, in part to clean it up, in part just to show you some of the different capabilities that the editor in Camtasia Studio offers. First thing we need to mention is that the editing we're going to be doing is what's called non-destructive editing. That is, we're not going to be actually making any changes to this raw video file up here, the camrec file that we just recorded. What we're going to be doing is telling the Camtasia Studio editor to uh, make certain changes to the version of this video that we have on the timeline here and to save those changes in the project file but not alter the original uh, camera file up here. That way if we change our minds later we can go back and start from scratch and edit all over again without having destroyed our camera file. So we just start playing it and see how it looks and sounds. Slowing the cursor down will help you create better... Okay, the sound is okay. The, the sound waveform, which is what you... the peaks that you see here in the blue, um, look okay. They're not hitting the top of the... Um, uh, of the track here, which would indicate distortion. We can always adjust the audio volume a bit by selecting the clip that we're working on and clicking the audio tab here on the interface. We can do things like uh, level volume, which is not going to be necessary here. We can, uh, that's called normalization. We can remove noise if we have background noise due to an environmental issue or perhaps some hiss in the microphone or something. We can take care of that. We can also uh, do things like uh, bring the entire volume for the clip up and down. We can decide to fade the volume in, fade it out. We can wipe out portions of the track, uh, the soundtrack, especially useful when you're trying to get rid of ums in your recording, and so on. Um, the most nor, most common adjustment is volume up or down, and you can do that with these buttons, though it's actually a lot easier to mouse over this line that you see right here, this white line, and uh, get that double-headed arrow, and then you can bring your volume up and down uh, by just clicking and dragging, and it's much more visual. So that looks good, we'll just leave it there and go back to the clip bin. After checking volume, typically the first thing you'll do is called trimming. You've probably got some dead space in the recording at the beginning and the end, or there may be things that you just want to get rid of uh, at the beginning of the end, or the end, and that's called trimming. So we'll go to the beginning here and we'll notice that there's a fair bit of dead air there. We probably don't need that much, so I, I'll probably trim a little bit of that off. 
trimming in Camtasia Studio is really easy. We'll just uh, put the playback cursor here at the point where we want to begin the trim, which in this case is the zero point on the timeline. And then we're going to select the portion of the timeline, the, the duration that we wish to clip out. We do that by using the little ears here on the uh, playback cursor, or the edit cursor. Uh, we can use the one on either side. I'm going to use the red one on the right here, the so-called out point, as it's also called. If I just click that red square there and drag to the right, I can select a portion of the clip on the timeline. To cut that portion out, all I have to do is right-click with the mouse button and select Cut. And that cut out some of that dead air. Remember that um, it didn't actually alter this Camrec file up here. It just told Camtasia Studio not to use that first little bit of the clip. Okay, let's play through now. Slowing the cursor down will help. That's better. Um, also, oops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, to put the cursor back together, you can just double click on the trapezoid there, and then everything will be will move together again. Now, anytime I see a bunch of dead air in the in a recording like this, I begin to wonder. Well, do I really need that? Was there anything going on there? Maybe I'll cut that out and make it shorter and crisper. Let's look here. Well, nothing was changing in my preview screen up here during this time, and there doesn't appear to be any sound. Let's play through that. That was me taking a breath and thinking. That doesn't need to be in the final, uh, final production. So I'm just going to, again, select that section just like I did before by clicking on the out point and dragging the selection or dragging the part of the cursor to the right. And I'll right click and cut that. Another big exhalation there I don't need. Now, I don't want to cut out this part here where I'm bringing up the charms, but uh, I can bring it right up to that. Just stop just short of that. Let's see. And if I'm having trouble hitting the exact point I need to here, I can always magnify the timeline to make it easier. That's what this tool right here does. I can click and drag this slider to the right and the timeline magnifies so it's easier to work in tight uh, corners here. That's a lot easier. So I probably don't, that's probably as much of that as I should cut out. Well, maybe I can get a little more because I'm still not talking here. I don't really need that time and date stamp, so. Well, that's probably about the best I can do there. Let's get some more of that out. All righty. And enter Control Panel into the search box. All right, here I've got some more dead air. Let's see if I'm actually doing it. Well, I'm actually typing there and operating, so I don't really want to get rid of that. But let's play through that and see. Click on the Control. Okay, I don't really need all that. Once I've gotten to the point where the screen doesn't change for a bit. I don't really need all that up until the point I start talking again, so I can cut that out too. Brevity is the soul of wit here. You want to keep things as crisp and as short as you can. Click on the control panel, hit to open the same. Ah, everything. And of course, generally, you'd play through the whole thing to make sure that you recorded what you thought you did and that you, you didn't miss something. But here, I, th I think we can be fairly confident of this. And here we've got another stretch of dead air. Now I'm about to run off the part of the clip that I can see here so I can move the clip left and right, move up and down the timeline using this scroll bar here. So let's see. Double click. I don't need all. That's dead air again. 
I'm just waving the mouse around trying to find the mouse <laughs> control panel. Double click the mouse icon. Now there are things happening, so I don't want to cut this out. But uh, I'm staring at the mouse, I'm staring at the box for a while. Nothing going on here. But we can cut this out. Nothing changing on the screen. Right up to there. And I have the big breath there. I don't need that. Um, I'll show you an alternative way to get rid of that. Say there were something up here on the screen you didn't want to get rid of, but you really didn't want to hear that big intake of breath. I can just select that much of the timeline and go to the audio uh, editing panel and just click silence. That'll wipe out that big breath. Then just double click the uh, playback cursor to get it back together again. And here's what we got. Icon. Click on the pointer. No more breath. You can do that when you say um too. <laughs> Your options tab. All right, this stuff At the happened. top of the pointer options tab is the selection to adjust pointer speed. Adjust the slider to your preferred speed. All right, let's see. Did I move that slider? There, I've moved the slider. And I'm just wool gathering here. Nothing going on, nothing changing on the screen. Now look up here and there's just nothing going on, so I can get rid of that too. So you can spend quite a bit of time cutting here. You should notice an immediate effect on the speed of your... And then we'll, uh, you get the idea on that. Well, here's one more big one. Let's go ahead and look at that. When done, now you'll just press... Oh yeah, that was, the, uh, that was when I was telling you how to stop the recording. We don't need that in here, so let's just... That's really the end of the video about right there. So let's just get rid of that, trim off the end of the clip that we don't need. And we've got the, tri the clip trimmed up pretty neatly. There's not a lot of dead air, a lot, not a lot of waiting for things to happen. Wow, that really shortened that up quite a bit. We're down to a minute and 21 seconds. We were at like a minute and 57 with the original recording, so that's a worthwhile activity. Uh, the next editing trick I'm going to show you it uses a screen annotation tool in Camtasia Studio called Callouts. You access them from this uh, little uh, tool right here on the toolbar, and the purpose of a callout generally is to call attention to something happening in a, on a particular point or area on the screen uh, that's more dramatic than just pointing at it with a mouse cursor. At one point in this video, I was telling folks to swipe in the lower right-hand corner of the screen, screen to bring up the Windows 8 Charms menu. That may be unusual for folks uh, new to Windows 8. So I want to find the point in my video where I was saying that and we'll insert a call out there to make that a little bit more clear. Right corner of the screen. Okay, a little too late. Mouse cursor. First move your mouse. Okay, that's probably about the best time to have this call out appear. And the position of the edit cursor will determine where the call out first appears, though we can adjust that later. Uh, I get my call out menu here. I can expand that menu to see all the call outs. And I'm just going to take the, the, the first one, the under shapes with text, the pointy arrow. To insert that, I just click on that, and I get a pointy arrow here that's going to overlay my video. Well, I want it down here in the lower right. I can click and drag it over by just clicking inside it. 
I can make it a little bigger or smaller uh, at need. I can also rotate it. If I mouse over the rightmost of the two little circles in the center of the image, I can click and drag and rotate that a little bit so that I'm pointing diagonally down at the right-hand corner of the screen and move that over. I can also add some text to that by going back to my uh, call-out edit screen here and just click in that text box and uh, I'll just say swipe here. I can see the preview here. That's a little small, so let's make it a little bigger. I can uh, change my text size here. Let's try uh, 24. I'm going to make it a little bigger than that, probably, and try 28. Uh, maybe one more, maybe 36. Now that's getting a little too big. And I, I'm not limited by these presets here. Maybe 32. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Now let's see what that looks like and sounds like when we play it. To slow down your mouse cursor, first move your mouse to the lower right corner of the screen to bring up the Windows 8 charms. I maybe started that just a little early. That's no problem. I can just click and drag this. Here's the callout object on our track 2, which was automatically dropped there when we created it. I can just scooch that a little to the right by clicking and dragging it. Let's see if that looks better. Move your mouse to the lower right corner of the screen to bring up the Windows 8 charm. That's better. Click on the search charm. I, that probably lasts a little longer than, it need, than is needed. That's no trouble. I can shorten it by just clicking, uh, mousing over the right-hand edge of the call-out object here and scooching it back some. And after every time you make a uh, change, you try the lower right corner of the screen to bring up the Windows 8 charms. Click on the search charm and enter control panel. All right. Um, that's about right. If at any point I make a change that I don't like, I can always go back a step and undo the last thing I did. I can do that under the Edit menu and just select Undo, and we'll go right back to where we were. But if I just ah, maybe I really did like that, I can redo it and go back. So I, you can go back and forth, make changes, and remember, you're not making any permanent changes to the original recording, so if you get things just so bollocked up that nothing is working for you, you can just start over again without any problem. Another way to call attention to something happening on a particular part of the screen and make it easier to see is called zoom and pan. Um, at one point, we are actually adjusting the pointer speed right about there. And that, of course, this will all be bigger when we play it back, finally, uh, for our audience, but that area, that might be a little hard to see, especially if somebody is watching this on their smartphone, which is a possibility. So let's see if we can't just zoom in on that while we're uh, uh, talking about it. Well, let's find out exactly where we need the zoom effect to start. We'll back off a little bit and play. The pointer options tab. And we're going to be dealing with this slider right here. At the top of the pointer options tab, from about this point onward. So maybe I can have my zoom and pan effect, which is kind of like a call out, uh, appear right here. I can do that by going to zoom and pan. And this is a really simple uh, thing to manage. 
All I have to do, uh, given this view of my a preview of my uh, screen, is to adjust the size of this outline here using these little round handles so as to move my point of focus and to magnify it by just making this smaller. So I'm going to go to the uh, corner handle here, click and drag, and watch, us, watch what's happening over here on the right to my uh, view. Now I can see that pointer a lot better. And I can maybe adjust the position of this window a little bit as well. That's the pan part. We just did the zoom. That looks pretty good. So, let's see what that looks like when we play it back. At the top of the pointer options tab is the selection that. to adjust pointer speed. Adjust the slider to your preferred speed. You should notice an immediate effect on the speed of your cursor. Now that's, at this point we probably need to zoom back out so we can see uh, the rest of the screen. That's real simple to do. We just go back to our edit, zoom, and pan here. And I could either just manually readjust this window here, or if I just want to go back to full screen, I can use this tool right here. Bang. So we're back to full screen. Now let's play that through and see what it looks like and sounds like. At the top of the pointer options tab is the selection to adjust pointer speed. Adjust the slider to your preferred speed. You should notice an immediate effect on the speed of your cursor. Click OK to close this window. And there we're back to full screen. And we can of course do that as often as we like. I'm just going to do it once here to illustrate it. But this can happen quite uh, as many times as you like. The objects on the timeline that indicate the zoom and fan, pan which, are, which is an example of a so-called visual effect, uh, appear here, in the, right in the clip. And you can, do, you can move those about a bit if you want to, and uh, change their behavior a little bit, though that's generally not necessary. Well, there are lots more. Uh, visual effects and callouts and so on that you can add to your presentation, but enough is generally enough. You do it. You don't want to do this just to uh, for the fun of it. You want it to have some bearing on the uh, viewing experience, a positive bearing on the viewing experience. So we're just going to leave those two uh, uh, effects in place and go about dressing up this. Uh, presentation in uh, different ways. I'm going to unzoom it a bit there so I can see where we're at. A little bit more, a little bit better. Now we're going to add something to this presentation. Go back to the clip bin here. Um, I recorded a, an introduction to this presentation earlier using a webcam. It's motion video. And Camtasia will edit normal motion video just as well it will, as it will edit screencasts. I can bring that clip in by going to the Import Media button. This allows me to pull in other media that I've already created or that I've found somewhere video, still images, it's audio, etc. It just brings up a file find box and I happen to know my uh, files are in my Camtasia Studio folder in my document library which is where we're going to be working pretty much exclusively here. And it's in a folder called um, Let's see, NBEA Camtasia. And here's the introductory video that I wanted. 
I can just open that and it will appear in the clip bin. Now, I want this to uh, appear at the beginning. It's an introduction. But I don't seem to have any room on the timeline there. What am I going to do? Well, obviously, I can do something about that. What I want to do first is move all of this stuff out to the right on the timeline so I have a place to put this video in. But I don't want to, if I just, I can move any of these tracks individually, but I don't really want to do that. I want to move them as a block because I don't want my call out to get uh, put in the wrong place or to end up in the wrong point on the timeline. So I can temporarily uh, select the in everything that's on the timeline by clicking and dragging, like so, making sure that I include everything. Then I can just pick this up, left click with the mouse, and drag it out to the right here. That should give me a spot at the beginning to put this uh, video. And I can put this video on the timeline just by clicking and dragging it down onto any of these tracks. I'll just use track one here. Actually, I think I'm going to use track two for a reason I'll show you in a minute. All right, so that's going to, that was a pretty good guess. That's going to fit in there quite neatly. Um, and then I'll bring this over. Oop, oh darn. All right, I moved that, and I didn't really want to do that. So let's edit, undo. That gets my call out back in the right place. Okay, now I need to, to move this again, I need to select just that part, and then move it over. And when I get this clip right to the edge of the intro clip, uh, so that there won't be any black screen in between them when I play back, I get this little snap line, yellow line, shows me I'm in just the right place, and those two are butted up right against one another, even though they're not on the same track. That doesn't matter. The fact that they're on the track, uh, not on the same track, just doesn't matter at all. The playback will look fine, like so. Ah, but uh, this new clip here probably needs some trimming. Let's take a look at that. There are many tips. That was probably a little too much of me smiling, so let's trim this just as we did before. Cut. And I definitely don't want my looking down here and so on. There's way too much time at the end of this. So we'll trim off, not quite right to where I finished speaking, but leave a little bit there because we're going to do a transition between these two in a moment. Okay, I'm going to cut that, and it's probably going to be easier if I go ahead and drag this down and get it all on the same timeline. So let's see what that looks and sounds like. There are many tips that can help you create better screencasts. This video is going to cover... All right, you get the idea, yada, yada, yada. No big... Um, dead air here. Uh, I would go through this normally and make sure I didn't say um at any place or anything like that, but we will accept that here. video is going to show you how to do that. Okay, and then my screencast. Slowing the... And the sounds match pretty well. I can see that the peaks are about the same. It sounded pretty good, so... I can probably, probably not have to edit this, maybe just a tiny bit down on this one, so I can um, click that, select just this clip. I'm not going to affect this one over here. I'm just going to affect this one by selecting it. Uh, go to the Audio tab, and maybe bring the audio down just a hair, just a hair. Okay. Now that the transition between these two is what's called a cut. Uh, one clip disappears and the other reappears snap like that. We can make that a little less abrupt if we wish by going to the transitions tool here. And since I want to illustrate that for you, I'm going to do that. You have a blue million, well, 
at least a couple dozen transitions that you can use here. And they're fun to play with. I strongly recommend you, you play with them. But, but in the end, you're probably mostly going to want to use the one called the Fade. It is by far the best transition. Uh, the vast majority of your transitions should be fades. You can use these dramatic ones occasionally. Oh, what the heck, we're having fun here. Let's go ahead and, and do a, um, oh, let's do a wheel. To put a transition in between these two clips, all I have to do is select the transition, click and drag it, and put it right in between them, in between the two clips. I see the little transition object there, so that tells me I've got it. Now watch what happens. I'll show you how to do that. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Okay, so that's all there is to adding a transition between two clips. All right, so I've added a clip to my presentation. There's something else I might add. The, uh, it's often customary to start off with a title slide that introduces your presentation, gives the title, and so on. Uh, that's easy enough to do. That will be a, generally a still image, a, a screen, or a, a, a picture, if you will, that we'll probably put right up front here. Oh darn, I should have thought of that sooner, but that's no problem. I can move all of this over again very easily. It's going to be helpful if I uh, uh, minimize my time or uh, uh, zoom out my timeline a little bit so I can see everything at one time. And I, again, I click and drag and select the entire uh, timeline, make sure I get all the clips and the call out and all that. And I can just move, click and drag, move that out of the way again. And go back to my clip bin, and I'm going to import a slide that I've previously made. There it is right there. And that goes into the clip bin under Images. And uh, just as I did with the introductory video, I'm just going to drag that down onto the timeline. I'll just go ahead and put it on track one with everything else here. And I don't need that on the time or showing too long. The default I believe is five seconds. Let's see. So that's probably enough. Now I can just again select all this stuff and drag it back over and bump it right up against the uh, title slide. So let's see how that looks. There are many tips that might even have been a little too long. Let's I can just I can reduce that in length. Uh, you can it's very easy to control how long a still image uh, appears on the screen by just mousing over the dividing line between the still image and the clip to the right here. And I'll just scoot that out of the way a little bit, make it a little or scoot it narrow it a little bit. Um, making it shorter. Then I'll again select this lot and just bump it up and let's see how that looks. There are many... T okay. Appears to be pretty good. We could always put a transition in between those two. This time let's use a fade for sure. There's my fade. Just going to drag that down here, put it right in between those. And I could even fade in the uh, slide, if I like, by putting a fade at the beginning of it. Probably would have been easier if I made that a little bigger. There you can see it a little better. Um, now let's see what that looks like. We're coming up from black. And there's my slide. There are And there I am. And we're off to the races. So we've just added a still image uh, to our presentation. By the way, that slide was created with something you almost certainly have on your computer.
PowerPoint. It's a great uh, slide editor for creating stills for use in video production. Another little trick I can show you here is that I can even get rid of these black edges that are going to show in the final video if I don't do something. I can, uh, in my canvas here, as it's called, in my preview window, I can adjust the size and position of elements on the canvas, like this still image. For instance, I can just stretch this out. And that's not really going to hurt this image, especially. So now I don't have those dark edges. There are I'm going to do something about these dark edges here in a moment, too. Now, we can keep tinkering with this presentation forever. And one of the most important things in video production like this is knowing when to stop. But I'm not quite ready to stop. There's a couple more tricks I've got to show you here. Uh, next, you might wonder why I shot myself in front of that nasty green backdrop. That's not especially... Uh, beautiful. Well, I did have a reason for that. This is something of an advanced technique I'm about to show you, but it's not difficult to do. I did that, I used that green color because I want to employ a technique called chroma key, which will allow me to replace that green color with any image or video that I want. The first thing I've got to do is apply the chroma key adjustment to remove this green color. I can do that uh, under my More tab in my menu bar here, under Visual Properties. There's lots of stuff we can do here, but this is one we're going to try. And I can go down and select Remove a Color. That gives me my chroma key control panel. And the first thing I have to do is tell Camtasia what color I want to remove. I can remove any color. This could have been, this green background could have been any color, as long as a solid, evenly lit color. But uh, green light of this shade is generally used because nobody would be caught dead wearing that color. <laughs> Because obviously I can't wear that color and then remove it from the um, uh, from the production, or I'll become the Invisible Man. So, but I do have to tell Camtasia now which color I want to remove. The easiest way to do that is click this little color menu here, and rather than trying to duplicate that color from a color palette, which nobody could do, I'm going to select the color from the screen. That's what you'll always do. So I just take my little eyedropper up here somewhere and pick out a, 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 a pixel near me, or near my head somewhere, and select it, he said. Okay, there we go. Now, to remove that color, I just increase this tolerance slider here. The first thing I'll do is click right on myself so I'm sure I've got this particular uh, clip selected for processing. And then I'll just click this little color menu here, and I'm going to select the color I want to remove. I do that by just clicking the tip of my little eyedropper icon here on a particular uh, pixel. Bang. Magic. It's not quite perfect, you know. This is a little bit of green still left down here. So I can adjust that with the tolerance slider here. Moving that to the right will get rid of some of the green. I don't want to take this too far to the right, though, or I start disappearing. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> bring me back. you got to hit a happy medium there. And that's the only slider, generally, you really have to adjust you can uh, monkey with the softness here a little bit, which may help some get rid of a little bit of green tint in my hair and so on here. Hue 
generally you want to leave alone. That, that you, can, you can mess with skin tones a little bit and so on that way if you like. Adjust your colors some. Defringe can make your edges uh, around the uh, chroma key a little bit cleaner. Just tinker with that a little bit. Again, you can also do harm. So just move it back and forth a little bit until you, and keep adjusting these until you get the desired effect, which is a nice crisp edge and nothing but black behind, the, uh, behind me there. Now I get to decide what I want to appear behind me. It could just be a still image, but it can be a video too. I'll need to go get a video if I want to put something behind me here. So I go to my clip bin, and just as I've done before, I'll import media. And here's the little video I want to use, which I've prepared. I'll put that in the clip bin down here. But the question then becomes, where am I going to put that in order to have it appear behind me? Well, this is where having multiple video tracks comes into play. I need, if I want myself to overlay the video, I have to have myself on a track higher than the one that I, where I put the video. So I need to move all of this stuff up by one track. That's easy to do. Again, I just uh, zoom in or zoom out or zoom in some, <laughs> and select everything on the timeline. And to drag it to a higher track, I just drag it up. And that automatically creates a new track for me. Make sure I haven't moved it uh, on the timeline left to right. And now I have a track underneath all of this. Let's make this a little bigger again so I can see what I'm doing. And now I can just drag this stock video, which I pulled off the internet, right underneath onto track one. And then I'll drag it over to where it's right at the beginning of me. And look at that. I'm overlaying that video. Now, right now, the video is too small because it was, I just had to take the size that I found on the Internet. But that's no problem. You can adjust the size and position of different video clips in the video canvas just by selecting them clicking on them on the timeline, and clicking and dragging the uh, handles. Notice the little snap lines that come up when I get just to the edge of the canvas so that I don't lap over. And look at that. It's right behind me. There are many tips that can help you create better screencasts. And if you listen carefully, you can even hear the waves coming ashore on Sand Dollar Beach at Big Sur on the California coast. Think people are going to believe I really have an office window looking out over that? Yeah, right. All right, let's clean that up a little bit. Um, let's see what it looks like as we transition into it. There are uh, the video is snapping in with a cut while I'm fading in. So let's see if we can fade in the video. We'll go to Transitions, which have been bumped off my menu bar here, but they'll be under More. There they are. Let's try fading that in, see how that works. I can always fade in. There are many tips that... Probably want that fade... Let's scoot that out just a hair there. Scooch it out. These are all technical terms. Scooch. Let's try that. There are many tips that can help. Well, that'll do. Now, I've also uh, got this running, got this uh, wave video running all the way through the rest of my 
presentation. And I don't want that because it's going to, the, that wave sound is going to be in the background. I don't need that all the time. So let's clip off what we don't need of this. I really only want this to go out to my, the end of my uh, introduction here. So if I very carefully select the wave video clip, I can now split this clip at the playhead here using the split tool right here. That cuts that into two clips. And the reason I did that is now I can select the right-hand portion of that clip, the later portion, and just hit the delete key on the keyboard. Or I can right-click and cut, but delete on the keyboard will work. And that takes that out. And let's see what that transition out now looks like. This video is going to show you how to do that. Yeah, I guess that'll be all right. I could muck with it some more if I wanted to, but it's probably not necessary. Remember knowing when to quit. It's never going to be perfect. you got to just walk away from it at some point and move on to the next one. We've got some cool stuff going on here. Well, I can't resist just one more adjustment. Uh, these black bars here are annoying me a little bit. They're there because the video that I recorded wasn't exactly the right uh, 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 dimensions for my project canvas here. It wasn't quite 1280 by 720. It's a little less than 1280 horizontally, uh, pixels that is. And um, as a result, I get these black bars in the canvas, and that will be in my final video if I don't do something about that. You know, certainly is something you could live with, but this is easy enough to correct, and it does utilize another feature that uh, you ought to be aware of in the um, uh, preview canvas here called crop mode. I can crop out, just as I can crop a, uh, a, a picture with a pair of scissors where I put it in my album, I can crop out these black bars. I do that by making sure I'm in the right clip and that I can, I can see myself on the screen by putting the playback cursor in the right place on the timeline. And I can activate crop mode by, clipping the, uh, by clicking on this little crop symbol here. That's a universal crop symbol. And uh, now if I click here, I've got crop handles and I can bring in the edges of this clip, click and drag it over, and watch what happens. That, that video comes in from behind. So I can crop out that black bar, and I can do the same thing on this side. And that, and that will apply to everywhere that image uh, appears on the timeline until I hit a, a boundary between two clips anyway. So let's see what that all looks like now. There are many tips that can help you create better screencasts. This video is going to... Okay, I don't need to listen to all of that. Let's get now to the crop out, but no more black bars. Let's go down here. Okay. Well... I could keep tinkering with it, <laughs> but I think I better stop right now and produce it. And indeed, uh, one of the things I'll want to do, and I probably should have done before now, is save my project. Before I start doing anything else, I don't want to lose all those edits I've made. So it's a good idea to save your project periodically. I got excited there and didn't do that for a while and got away with it. You may not someday. And you will hate yourself. So periodically do file, save project to update that project file. Now if, I, if the power went off or if uh, the computer crashed and blitzed everything, I could bring this project back up right at this point without having to redo any of that stuff that, I'd, that we just spent a half an hour doing. And we also avoid exercising our vocabularies. So we have our nice 
neatly edit, edited video here in, Cam, in the Camtasia Studio editor, but we can't really share that with anyone uh, unless they had Camtasia Studio. <laughs> it would be rather awkward to share it in any case. So what we need to do now is called production or publishing. We need to uh, output this video in a format that other people can view without having Camtasia Studio and that will stream across the web to them so they can just click on a link in a website or in Blackboard or whatever and, and bring this video up. To do that we're going to use the produce and share tool here on the uh, editor interface and we get our production wizard. Thank goodness Camtasia is going to lead us through this process. We have a bunch of different options here that we can choose from. Uh, the simplest options by far are either share to screencast.com. Remember your screencast.com account you got with Jing? Well, you can send this video right to it as well as sending Jing's to it. That has a lot of advantages. Uh, the site is optimized for hosting screencasts. All of the bells and whistles you put in here will survive on screencast.com for sure. And um, your uh, uh, the publishing process is going to be super easy. For instance, if I just click on share to screencast.com, go next. I just have to give my uh, login email name and my password to Camtasia so that it can automatically log this into screencast.com. And then just click next. It logs me into screencast.com. It takes a look at my folder structure there and so on. It will allow me to uh, add a title or change the title if I wish. I can even choose which folder at screencast.com to put this into. And I have a series of production options that I can look at in terms of um, video settings and so on. Probably most of the time you won't bother with any of these. On the video settings tab, I usually crank the quality up. The default is 50%. Uh, I usually crank the quality up to about 75% or so. You don't want to go much above that or you'll, you'll make huge files for no particular increase in quality. This is about the point of diminishing returns. Normally this would be at about 50%. We'll just leave it there. Um, relatively few options that you need to pick here. And then you just click Finish, and this will send this to screencast.com automatically. You don't have to do anything else. Then screencast.com will pop up a window on the screen here. I'm not going to wait for that to happen. You can try this on your own. But screencast.com will pop up a window here that has the URL for the video stored at screencast.com that you can put into a hyperlink or into an email or into a web link in Blackboard so that your users can click on it and view the video. So I'm just going to cancel out of that. It's almost as easy to send this to YouTube. We'll click Next. I indeed, it's easier, really. Though you have to have your YouTube, a YouTube account set up and you have to have a, an active channel created in YouTube. We have uh, some videos that will be on the supplementary site for this uh, presentation that will show you how to do that. But assuming you have that all set up, at this point all you have to do is click Next and it will start. There's really nothing else you have to do here. I am going to show you another production option where you have more control over the output parameters uh, that you're going to uh, create. And uh, this is a process that will allow you to host your video 
on a local media server, a local web server, rather than using uh, cloud options. It's a little bit more complex, not much, but it is a useful thing to know how to do. So let me show you how to do that. What we'll do now is select Custom Production Settings and just hit Next in the production to go into the production wizard. Here, for the first time, you have options in terms of what the uh, output format for this video is going to be. Up to now, the, for, uh, the options have been flash, period. And that's most likely what you're going to uh, select. But with custom production settings, you can select a flash HTML hybrid output. The reason that's important is that some devices, notably Apple iOS devices, will not play Flash video. But they will play uh, H.264 encoded HTML5. Uh, don't worry about that. This selection right here, the recommended selection, produces a hybrid player in the, in the, produce, in the published video that is capable of recognizing the device that is requesting the video across the web and it will automatically send to that device a video format that it can play. This format then allows you to allows your customers, your students, your clients to play these videos back on not only on just about any computer but also on just about any mobile device including intentionally crippled Apple iOS devices. Take that Steve Jobs. The, uh, but you have other options here if you have a specific reason for selecting them. Uh, if you're a diehard Windows person and you want this in WMV Windows Media Video format, well you can do that. If, you're a, if you hate Flash and you want this in MOV, you can get that. You can even get just the soundtrack if you want to publish this as a podcast that your students can listen to in the car as they're driving. So 99% of the time you're going to take the recommended option, but you do have options here that you did not have in other production uh, wizards. So we'll just take that default option and go next. Uh, we get those same options that we saw with screencast.com a moment ago, too. We can uh, adjust various production settings. Again, the one that I usually, the only one I, re uh, I play with is the video settings quality. Um, I can make sure I'm in quality mode. Uh, Bitrate mode gives you a smaller file, but things are blurrier and the sound doesn't sound as good and so on. So this is a pretty good compromise. Uh, again, you might, uh, depending on how much fine print you have in the, uh, in the screencast, you might slide this back and forth a little bit. You really have to do this by trial and error. You can produce the video over and over and over again until you get something that you like the look of and the sound of. And I'm just going to leave this stuff pretty much where it is. Um, lots of bells and whistles here if you want to play with it later. So we'll just leave that alone, go next. This is a branding screen. You can add copyright, uh, copyright information here uh, and information about the project. I usually don't bother. You can include watermarks, you can cr create SCORM packages for input into Blackboard and other learning management systems. That's generally not necessary. That's a uh, definitely an advanced technique that's generally not necessary. So I'm usually on this screen, unless you really uh, want to add that copyright information, I'm just, you'll just click Next. And here's your final screen before production. The uh, Output file name is here. By default, it's the name of the project, if you've named that. You probably want to leave that alone, but you do have the option to change it here. You also have the option to tell Camtasia where to save the output, because this, this process is going to output the, your finished presentation to the hard drive 
on your computer. And this uh, little icon will allow you to determine where it goes on the hard drive. Normally I put mine in my Camtasia Studio folder under Documents so I have everything in one place and I don't have to go searching around for it. The rest of this I would just leave alone. Most of it's informational anyway. You can tinker with it if you like. And once you've uh, approved the file name and decided where you want to save the thing, all you have to do is click Finish and production begins. This can take anywhere from a less than a minute to hours depending on the complexity and the length of the video. Looks like this one's going to be pretty quick. Also this depends on how fast your computer is. Up to this point uh, everything you've seen can be done on almost any modern, uh, modern computer. Something bought in the last three or four years, five years will run Camtasia Studio quite nicely. This is where the processor speed and memory come in. The faster your processor and the more memory you have, the faster that little blue bar is going to go across the screen. Now, once that finishes, if you keep the default options, the next thing that's going to happen is that you're going to get a preview of your video. This is to just reassure you that it did uh, produce the way you expected to. Uh, the process that we just went through, in addition to being called production, is also called rendering. Rendering is when you boil something down, reduce the size and the volume, um, like making soap from fat and, and potash and so on. And that's what we've just done with this video. We've gone from a proprietary Camtasia Studio only video format where the files were just huge files that would never stream across the internet to something which is small enough stream, stream across the internet and can be played back by anybody anywhere who has a computer uh, uh, equipped with a flash player or a mobile device with their own players that can play HTML5 video. It's always a good idea to check this out. Make sure it's going to play. There are many tips Look at that. that can help you create better screencasts. You can this video scrub through this your control panel into the search box. You can pause it. You can uh, look around, see what's going on, make sure everything came through all right. And everything looks good. So we have successfully loaded our, um, uh, our video presentation onto the hard drive on the computer. Let's take a look and see where it went. I can go to my Windows Explorer here, go to Documents, Camtasia Studio, and I called this Mouse Slow Demo. So it should be in a folder with that same name. There it is. There is our present, a rendered presentation on the hard drive. Let's take a look inside and see what, those, what that folder looks like. All of these files constitute your presentation. Here's your actual video file. It's about 47 megabytes in size. That's not very big for video. You can get a lot of those either on your screencast.com account or on your web server. The rest of the stuff you don't really have to worry about. Uh, it, it, these are the files that play the presentation and make it possible for your clients to view them. There is one file we want to look, uh, we want to be aware of though and that's this one right here, the file name that ends in player. This is your adapted, adaptive player file, your so-called smart player file. And this is the file that you want to link to if you put this on the web manually. So how might we do that? Well, it so happens that I have uh, write access to my web server here on my network, so all I have to do to publish this file to the web now is go back to my 
Camtasia Studio folder and find that uh, folder that, that contains my presentation again. I'm going to right click there and copy that to my clipboard. And I'm going to bring up my web server. I have to log in. Remember my password. A lot to think about here. Here's my web server. I'm going to put this in my folder on the web server. And I'm just going to copy that folder in. Right click, paste. And that's all it takes. That folder is now on the web server and it's now, this presentation is now available from the web. With your, if you have a web server or a media server, the process for you getting files up onto that server will probably be different than what you're seeing here. But probably not a great deal more difficult. All right, so my mouse slow demo folder containing my presentation that I've just rendered is now on the web server in the, my D. Giberson folder, which is in the root, the so-called document root of the web server. So how do I figure out how to access this from a uh, web browser? Well, I just have to know a little bit about how URLs work. And you can just tune out at this point if this is not of interest to you. You can just skip over this part. But I want to bring up uh, another window here. And I happen to know that my web server's name is online2.sdccd.edu. That's the canonical name of the web server in the domain name uh, uh, system. And this forward slash here represents the document root of the web server, the www root directory we saw that I saw before. And in that directory, there's a folder called dgibberson into which I place my presentation. And that presentation is in a folder called mouse slow demo. So I type that in. And then if I go back and look for a moment at the um, folder on the web server, let's see, I gotta find that. It's moved now. The alphabetical, there we go. If I open up that folder, the file I want to link to is this one, mouse slow demo underscore player dot html. I can type that or I can right click on the file name, very carefully click rename, very carefully select all of that and do a control C on the keyboard to copy that to the clipboard. Then click in the white somewhere so I don't accidentally change the name of that file, which would stop everything from working. Now I can come back here and I can do a control V and paste that in. And there, if I've done this correctly, let's say I'll press enter and look at that. That just came up off the web server. That's playing across the internet. And there's my URL. So there we are. We have published our video from, and we've gone from having nothing, recording the video, to having it published on the web in less than an hour. And it really takes a lot less time to do it if you're not talking about it. There is one more thing I'd like to show you before we quit here. Make sure I'm still recording here. Okay, I'm gonna Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna finish that process just to get back to my project here. I'm gonna save my project just in case I hadn't done that recently. And I'm going to show you one more thing real quickly. I mean, my presentation is done, maybe, if you don't live in California. But what if you have a hearing impaired student in your class who can see this but can't hear it, can't hear your narration? This video is not going to do him much good. Also, uh, in California, you can't put this on the web and use it for instructional purposes unless you caption it. Um, that's probably going to be coming to you at some point, even if you don't live in California. So the last thing I'd like to show you is how Camtasia Studio can help you caption 
your videos and screencasts once you've created them. I'm back here in my editor interface and I can bring up my captioning tool under more captions. And you're going to love this. Normally with captioning you would have to listen to the soundtrack and transcribe it, type it out. Listen, type, listen, type, listen, type. Watch this. I've got a little button up here that says speech to text. I click that. I want to do the entire timeline and I continue. And just this fast, I've got captions. So that when I play this video, there are many tips that can help you create better screen uh, And I've got a minor problem there. Let's see. This video is going to cover a very simple one. When you're recording a screencast, you often use the... Now, a couple of minor issues here that are easily correctable. One is that I apparently uh, it, it stuck in an extra blank caption. I can just merge that with the previous one and that should take care of that. Well, shucks. Let's see. Uh, I really don't want my captions to start that soon. There are many tips that can help you create better screen I want them synchronized. This video is well, they're still synchronized, but I really don't want this starting quite that soon. That's no problem. I can scoot that over until the beginning of my video there, the beginning of my talking head. There are many. There we go. Now the other, and there may be other minor issues that I can go through here but probably not. Also, however, you'll note that uh, there are imperfections in the captions. The voice recognition in Camtasia is not perfect. For instance, this first one here. Any tips that can help you create better screencasts? Well, tens is not tips. No problem. I can go in and I can edit that. Just like that, it's corrected. Didn't have to do much editing. The voice recognition actually can be quite amazingly good here. I probably need a period at the end of that line. And as I go through and look at my captions, I'm going to find other imperfections, but I can just play through the video and edit those imperfections very quickly. It's, it's not that big a deal. So we now have an ADA compliant video that any of your students can benefit from. Now let's take a look at what the final rendered version of this video with the captions will look like. There are many tips that can help you create better screencasts. This video is going to cover a very simple one. Note that these are closed captions. When you're captions, recording the screencast, and you can turn you them off. often use the mouse By cursor to the point button. out certain areas of the screen. If you move the mouse, this is what your clients will see when they play this back on their computer or their smartphone or their tablet. They will, if they're complaining, uh, and if uh, you have saved this to uh, your web server or to YouTube or to screencast.com. They'll see the captions. They'll be able to adjust volume. They'll be able to stop and start Oscar playback sir. and rewind and play something and over and over again. A very simple one. To allow them to really fully appreciate what you're saying. 
Well, we haven't covered every last feature in Camtasia Studio by any means, but we've probably covered the vast majority of the ones that you'll use on a regular basis. You'll find more information about Camtasia Studio on the website where you found this video. And you'll also find contact information for me, Dave Giberson. And there's nothing I like doing better than talking to people about screencasting. So please get in touch and stay in touch. Hope you enjoyed this and happy screencasting.